Hey everybody, it's Kyla. Welcome to my channel where I talk about the stock market and the economy amongst other things. Today, we're going to talk about the time premium. So I've been talking a lot about the debt ceiling on this channel and on my TikTok channel and on the Instagram channel as well. And I wanted to revisit the idea of the debt ceiling, but not in terms of the debt ceiling itself, but like what it means as a system. I am in the middle of writing a book. I'm in the final edits. And so that's been taking up a lot of my time, which is why I haven't posted on YouTube as much. Um, I am also doing several other projects that also are very time intensive and a little bit stressful. You know, everybody deals with it. Everybody wishes that we had just a little bit more time. And this funny battle that I've had with time over the past few weeks has produced a couple of lessons for me. So I lost my voice two weeks ago. You can go and watch my debt ceiling video where I had no voice. And I came down with like this really brutal sickness after that happened. And when I was sick, I was like, man, like there's so many things that I take for granted. And there's these like delicacies of presumed normalcy that we just assume are always going to remain within our lives and they could disappear really at any moment um, and then I was fortunate enough to be able to go home for Mother's Day I surprised my mom and it was the first time that I'd seen my family in several months which was really nice but it was again a reminder that we operate under this theory of assumed static that like nothing is going to change and overall there's a world of last times that I try not to spend too much time in <laughs> but the idea of it still really haunts me you know, life is short and there are no guarantees. And I really don't like spouting platitudes like that. Like I don't want to be a think boy newsletter, but uh, you know, it's hard to remember sometimes. And I want to talk about the dynamics of wasted time, through the debt ceiling design and vulnerability, of course. The systems are designed to confuse. So, so Dan Kaminsky, rest in peace, tweeted this back in 2018. I'm increasingly thinking that every functioning system has two forms, abstraction that outsiders are led to believe in the reality that insiders actually and carefully operate. You don't incrementally learn a system, you eventually unlearn its necessary lies. Most of what we interact with circles this stream, learning the unnecessary lies of a system, and a lot of the systems that we interact with rely on misunderstanding and misinterpretation to truly work. And that's the most convoluted part of what Dan is talking about, this idea that systems need to actively mislead in order to have room to function. It's confusing by design, right? Like it's all storytelling. Like when we think about what's going on at the debt ceiling, it's largely a function of narrative and measuring contest. And it's posing to prove something that needs to be proved in the marketplace of ideas at extreme cost to literally the entire country. The debt ceiling as a system, I've talked a lot about like the mechanics of the debt ceiling, the misunderstandings around the debt ceiling. Um, you know, I produced a video when I had no voice, which I think says a little bit more about my emotions than the actual functionality of the debt system or debt ceiling. Um, I think this is where Dan's analysis is really important. So we're focused on the fragment of the fractal of reality that the debt ceiling creates, right? Like that is, they're not operating in the same plane of existence that a lot of people are. They're just doing a political game show. And if you are like, oh, it's leverage and it's politics, sure, dude, read about it. Like, I don't know what to tell some people. The inaccuracy that we have in understanding the debt ceiling, is the, 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 that's the purpose. The, understand, the misunderstanding is not a bug, but it's a feature. And it, if it isn't actively confusing people, which it clearly is, it does not work. So Dan wrote, maybe that's why everyone's so focused on motivations to the extraordinary exclusion of everything else. Like if you can figure out what people personally want, like Manchin really wanted, whatever his name is, really wanted to build a natural gas thing in West Virginia, that's going to be pretty influential to the decisions that people make. But as one member of Congress said, we'll see where this comes out, but by definition, we're only measuring success on how much we've lost. It's a weird space to exist in, the photo negative of what is actually net good. And, you know, I did a TikTok on this too, but governments are designed to spend money. Uh, spending and financing authority are not the same thing. Political leverage is not putting the credit rating of the entire country at risk. It's confusing by design, and I think that is mostly okay. So there is this influence of design, though. Um, so I saw this nice thread from a woman named Michelle on UX design examples that she came across in Japan. And it made me think about how much of our time is spent butting up against the world, like just uncomfortable, especially in the United States. She ended the thread with human-centered design is sometimes a forced concept, but when there's enough care and respect, it becomes an inevitable byproduct. When we have a more effortless existence, we have more mental resources to take care of public goods and care for each other. Good design is really important and it's really hard and it's one of those things that we don't really think a lot about because it's almost subliminal. But if we live in a well-designed world, like a humanity-centered design which considers the entire globe rather than just the people living on it, then things become easier and simpler and nicer. 
Design is integral to systems, but sometimes they do have to mislead users. The correct use case and how something actually works are not always the same thing. Functionally, something can work one way, but designers need misdirection to protect the fragile but useful truths. Then again, systems work because you don't know how they work, but you think they do. Hmm. There's a Bob Dylan quote from jo Jonathan Cott's Listening, you must be vulnerable to be sensitive to reality. As Maria Popova wrote in regards to Dylan, self-knowledge might be the most difficult of life's rewards, the hardest to earn and the hardest to bear. To know yourself is to know that you are not an unassailable fixity amid the entropic storm of the universe, she's so good, but a set of fragilities in constant flux. To know yourself is to know that you are not invulnerable. I've written and talked a lot about the crisis of meaning, and I think that that same framework is applicable here too. That's one thing I think about with the debt ceiling and the markets at large is the separation of emotion that we create from the lived lives to the economy even though the two things are very integral and that makes total sense that we do that like we can't design policy around emotions or, or can we right uh, the economy is sentiment driven because it's driven by people but there is a broad resistance to any sort of reflection on emotion in the united states specifically for a myriad of reasons right like it's scary out here but when we lose touch with that vulnerability, we lose touch with ourselves and we lose touch with the world around us. There's collapsing social trust in the United States. As the Financial Times writes, levels of trust in the US have been eroding for decades and the share of Americans who say that they do not trust other people in their neighborhood is now roughly double what you would expect based on US socioeconomic development. There's no trust and like for a good reason, right? Like, hey, come on. <laughs> uh, there are three things that I think illustrate this dynamic well in their own way and they're completely unrelated to each other. So hang with me here, but this push pull of vulnerability and the intentional fluff of systems. So Walmart is the Federal Reserve. Walmart has become the kingpin of inflation, pushing their own private label brands because CPGs won't lower prices on grocery items. They're essentially becoming inflation fighters on their own turf, which is good and great even, but not how we would normally think about Walmart. And alfalfa is more important than the coin. I hope I said that right. As well, Alex Williams wrote, where and how do we grow alfalfa is, in his opinion, the kind of trade-off people should be using the tools of economics to sort out, not are there unforeseen consequences to the trillion dollar coin. We get so caught up in stuff that matters, the coin could have saved the debt ceiling, right? But we lose all focus on things that are important. The freedom to think. So this quote from Matt Darling, what did happen when Americans got better unemployment benefits is that they were freed up to think about what kind of job they really wanted and to pursue getting it. When we give people space to not be in fight or flight mode, they think better. All applicable, right? So positivity and negativity. J Jalen Amir King once wrote, jealousy is admiration turned sour. It has been stuck in my head. Every negative feeling is really a positive one, rotting. And I think a lot about that, how most things are not bad things, uh, but the really bad things are horrible things. And most things are good things if you peel them back a few layers, lessons learned and painful reshapings. Like we've all gone through that, right? Uh, it's all within perception. There's a tendency to get really blackpilled about the economy and the freaking debt ceiling and politics and the systems uh, that we interact with because it's so frustrating and so confusing. And it feels like any positivity that was once there is literally completely hollowed out. And when we abstract a system to be intentionally misleading, when the only way it works is if it's broken, then of course it's going to be frustrating, confusing, and hollow. And when the necessary unlearning begins to become more and more apparent, the vortex only grows deeper and wider and more painful. Dan again, societies try to provide kids a sanitized view of the world without work, without war, without sex, where you can fail on a test and not get fired from school. That's a lie. That's not reality. But knowing the lie has value in some way. The final thoughts. Systems are misleading, all right? <laughs> By design. I've been thinking a lot about Kurt Vonnegut's uh, telling his wife that he was going to go buy envelopes. It's a really beautiful passage. Oh, she says, well, you're not a poor man. You know, why don't you go online and buy 100 envelopes and put them in the closet? And so I pretend not to hear her. And I go out to buy the envelope because I'm going to have a hell of a good time in the process of buying one envelope. I meet a lot of people and see some great looking babes and a fire engine goes by and I give them a thumbs up. And then I ask a woman what kind of dog that is. And I don't know. The moral of the story is we're here on earth to fart around. And of course the computers will do us out of that. And what the computer people don't realize or they don't care about is we're dancing animals. You know, we're, we love to move around. And we're not supposed to dance at all anymore. Even amongst it all, it's supposed to be fun, right? Like it's supposed to be fun. Being alive is supposed to be a good time mostly. And we're supposed to dance. Martin Scorsese interview on growing old. I'm old, I read stuff, I see things, I want to tell stories and there's no more time. Tara, when he got his Oscar, when George and Steven give it to him, 
He said, I'm only now beginning to see the possibility of what cinema could be, and it's too late. He was 83. At the time, I said, what does he mean? And now I know what he means. And Nietzsche, on learning how to love, I love this passage. One must learn to love. In the end, we are always rewarded for our goodwill, our patience, fair-mindedness, and gentleness with what is strange. Gradually, it sheds its veil and turns out to be a new and indescribable beauty. That is, it's thanks for hospitality. Even those who love themselves will have learned it this, in this way, for there is no other way. Love, too, has to be learned. And I've, I've noticed that I personally tend to loop around certain ideas, OCD maybe, and if I get really caught in that loop, I get biased towards inaction and towards the idea of tomorrow, right? Like, you know, the death ceiling, or I'll talk to that person tomorrow, I'll do that tomorrow. The thing with looping is that tomorrow never comes. Tomorrow will always be tomorrow. And the perfect day never really happens, and time will only ever move forward even if you are not. The systems we live in are functionally confusing at best, and sometimes that's okay. It's okay to be frustrated and mad as long as we remember what we're doing, that we don't get so lost in the sauce of anger that we lose all sense of self. That's probably the best thing to remember. Finally, there's this poem for Sarah. I think I'll stare at this, a small wordless love. I think I'll stare at this music. Maybe that'll pass. A small wordless love that seeks to pass, pass over what ho it hovers over, over, pass away eventually. Everything passes away. I think I'll hold this in my attention, the small wordless love. Make ready for your gifts. Make ready. Everything passes away. I have some links of stuff that I've been reading in the description box below. This is a newsletter, kyla.substack.com. It's also a podcast, Let's Appreciate, and I'm on Instagram, TikTok, everywhere. Um, but yeah, if you want to go ahead and hit the like button, subscribe, share with a friend, it always helps. And I hope that you're doing okay out there. Talk to you soon.